You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. On this very special episode of Zoo Tours, for the very first time in the channel's history, we will not be presenting a zoo in America. I am very proud to welcome you all to the Paris Zoological Park, or the Parc Zoologique du Paris. But we're just going to call it the Paris Zoo. The park was officially born in 1934, and according to the zoo itself, they welcomed 5 million visitors in its first year. So it all started with unimaginable success. But as time passed, the zoo did not move along with it. Even at the turn of the 21st century, I hear that not much was changed. I couldn't find any examples, but apparently the exhibits were outdated and deteriorating. So to save the zoo, the doors actually closed in 2008, and after a six year renovation, the park reopened and visitors were treated to a completely new zoo. The Paris Zoological Park sits on 36 acres, which to me doesn't actually sound like a whole lot, but what it lacks in size makes up for some of the most unique qualities you will ever find from a zoo. The lands, or the biozones, bring you to the African savanna, the endangered wildlife of Europe, the ghosts of Madagascar, along with South America's tropics, and the several environments of Patagonia. Patagonia is a vast protected region that covers the southern end of South America, and there are so many South American attractions out there that only focus on its rainforest. And while Paris does have something like that, Patagonia represents three different habitats. Now before we begin, I cannot thank my friend Mark enough for bringing the Paris Zoo to Zoo Tours. This time he did not film with the crew. He went to France to film all on his own, and as usual, did an incredible job. So please enjoy his work and the debut of the Paris Zoo. Not too long ago, I asked what you thought is an underrepresented or an underappreciated zoo animal, and I was very happy to see a lot of you mention hoofstock. No, it's not an alpaca, and it's not a llama, so you're safe from debating which of the two it could be in your head. This is a vicuña a member of the camel family. So they are relatives of the llama and alpaca, but unlike their domestic ancestors, the vicuña is classified as a wild species. They fit right at home in the mountainous plains of the Andes region, where vegetation can be scarce, days can be unbearably hot, and the nights are freezing cold. As you can see, they have a lot of fleece to protect them. Fleece that has been highly valued for centuries. To the ancient Incas, its wool was equal to that of pure gold, and it was treated with respect and only reserved to be worn by royalty. And that respect remains in modern times. Vicuña wool is considered the finest, rarest, and most expensive in the world. But when Europeans invaded, they quickly became aware of its value and exported as much wool as they could back home. The problem was, compared to their cousins, it takes the vicuña much longer to regrow their wool, which is one reason why it was never domesticated. They were hunted for both their wool and meat, and nearly driven to extinction. In the 16th century, there were nearly 2 million vicuñas, and by the 1970s, only a few thousand were left. Thanks to government protection, export regulations from Peru, and after introducing herds to Ecuador, they are no longer considered endangered. And today, there are as many as 350,000 vicuñas in the wild. They still have a ways to go, but their story is still considered a conservation success. One really great thing about hoofed creatures is you can mix them with a lot of other species. We'll get to them in a few moments. The Alpine Hills, or Hill, appears to continue under and through the overpass 
into another dry valley, the zoo's second largest habitat, 4,500 square meters, and spans 180 meters, nearly the entire length of the Patagonia biozone. Like you will with the Vicuñas, you will find the Rhea, or Rhea, or what some might call the South American ostrich. Ostriches and Rheas are ratites, a group of massive flightless birds. If you were to ever see the two species on the same day, which you would here, they can look strikingly similar at a first glance, but have a few distinctions. The world's largest bird has two toes, while the Rhea has three. The biggest giveaway is their size. On average, a Rhea is about a meter shorter and 100 kilograms lighter, but both are adept runners and can quickly outrun some potential predators at 65 or so kilometers an hour. So the Darwin's Rhea live with the Vicuñas, and the greater Rhea's live with another Zootors first, I think. Its appearance is that of a rabbit crossed with a guinea pig, or maybe even a capybara with long ears, which is probably the best description. Patagonia maras are the fourth largest rodent in the world. We just learned why the world's largest rodent is famous for being so chill. But maras are built to be on the move. They prefer dry grasslands with a lot of open space. And like most animals that live on the plains, they use speed to their advantage. They don't necessarily run, they hop on all fours, like a gazelle would on the savanna. Combine that hopping with powerful hind legs that are longer than the front two, and you have a rodent that can leap nearly two meters in the air, and is clocked going 40 kilometers an hour. Mark was able to get the vicuña and the birds to run, but not these, so just use your imagination. I don't want to leave until I at least mention that the bird and the rodent live with the guanaco, an even larger member of the camel family. However, I would like to move on from the Pampas region and save their species spotlight for another time. As I implied before, the Amazon rainforest takes quite a bit of credit for South America's famous diversity, as it should. However, the continent is also no stranger to an abundance of marine life. Tropical and freshwater fish, whales, sharks, and several kinds of seals and sea lions. Another first for the channel. We've seen pinnipeds many times before, but we've never seen sea lions that are not named after California. Paris mixes South American sea lions with South American fur seals. Since they did flock together in unison, whichever one that I show might not be the one I'm referring to. That being said, some of you are probably wondering Where's the seal? Where are the sea pups with tiny flippers that bounce on their bellies to get around? Well, fur seals don't look that much different from sea lions. In fact, they are both in the same family of eared seals, which means they are not true seals. If you pay attention really closely, the South American fur seal has longer or more external ear flaps while their bark mates have slightly smaller ones, but it's all much more noticeable on land. There is one other huge difference between the two, but it's sort of less obvious. As most marine mammals do, they have a thick layer of blubber. It stores energy and provides insulation when they're swimming. That applies to the South American sea lion, but fur seals don't have the privilege of having all that extra fat because their fur is so thick, they don't need blubber to stay warm. Before we return to the mountainous forest, we have just one more stop that shows South America is abundant with marine life, even if it is just one other species. And for the sake of having a cool intro, we will start on the right side of the exhibit. Penguins a bird famous for their cute antics, lack of flight, 
and withstanding some of the coldest places on the planet. I think it's safe to say we've come across more penguins that favor temperate or warmer climates than those that inhabit the Antarctic Peninsula. In fact, you would find more kinds of penguins in South America and its surrounding islands than you would those that live closer to the South Pole. There are species that are as far south as Patagonia to as far north as the Galapagos Islands. Humboldt penguins live along the Humboldt Current on the continent's west coast. They stand at just over half a meter and don't exactly size up well against a shark, birds of prey, killer whales, and I hate to say it, but even fur seals. But sometimes, speed is on their side. As if just standing there doing absolutely nothing wasn't cool and cute enough, it's not every day that you get to see a frenzy of penguin zoomies, the aerodynamics of their streamlined bodies. With a little help of their strong flippers, Humboldt can swim up to 22 miles or 35 kilometers an hour. And some sources will even tell you that they can reach 30 miles per hour. And there's only a couple of reasons why they would need to go so fast. Evading predators and hunting. I'm gonna guess it's the latter in this case. The next time we cross paths with Humboldt, we'll learn just how far they'll go to find a meal. It only took three species to do it, but I think they proved the point that South America should be known for their marine life. Right now, we are making our way from the coastline back into the montane forests, steppes, and the scrublands to see if we can meet a fairly large kitty. I couldn't tell you from a European's perspective, but myself, and I imagine millions of others see the puma as a symbol of the North American frontier. But then I have to remind myself, we're talking about the most geographically widespread wildcat in the world, traversing 28 different countries, up to the southern regions of Alaska, to small pockets of the southeastern United States, all the way down to Patagonia. There are several subspecies of mountain lion, and some zoos will use a North American cougar to help represent South America. But thankfully, this is not the case. I found a few sources confirming that these are in fact Chilean pumas, apparently one of the few displayed in Europe and anywhere else outside of South America. There really isn't much of a noticeable difference between the subspecies. They do tend to be heavier in North America and it's kind of hard to explain. There's something about their eyes that's very distinct. These Patagonian pumas hold a lot of cultural significance. Some have seen them as a representation of strength, wisdom, and patience. Others have seen them in another way. They hunt them for sport, and farmers will poison them to protect their livestock. The puma is a keystone species which means if they disappear, their role as the top predator in this region will not be properly replaced with another species. If you would like to know the consequences of an example of that happening, click on that card in the corner. As I always do, whenever I have to present a harsh truth, I like to at least come back and end things on a high note. We are moving even deeper into the forest and playing I Spy with another small creature that's sure to make you smile. And when you do find them, it is very rewarding. The Andean Pudu. If you've been following our tours long enough, by now you'd know that deer come in all shapes and sizes and can even fit comfortably in your arms. Don't try that. At nine kilograms, and just 83 centimeters long. They are the smallest true deer in the world. Like most deer, the males do grow antlers, but not like how you'd expect. They are very small and don't grow out in branches or points. At most, they will have seven and a half centimeter long toothpicks. 
and grow backwards so they don't catch on any branches. You wouldn't really think that they have much use, and you wouldn't think that something as cute as this would show any kind of aggression, right? Males actually do use them to spar or clash their antlers in a fight to show who's boss. The magnificent and various landscapes of Patagonia is clearly a haven for a rich biodiversity. Personally, I don't come across South American exhibits too often. Even then, it's so nice to see at least some zoos are emphasizing the continent's lesser known variety of life. So when people think South America, they don't automatically think rainforest. I hope you enjoyed this first ever international episode of Zoo Tours, but it definitely won't be our last. Thanks to Mark, there's still plenty more to see in Paris. And when the time comes, I'll leave it up to you of what section you all would like to see next. So please stay tuned. See if you can answer this episode's trivia question. And thank you all for watching.